Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 613. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is July 28th, 2020. All right, before I tell you where I'm recording from, we're going to do a quick introduction to the program. In this introduction, I talk about how special it is to be a viewer of Anglican Unscripted, where you're so happy you go and click the like button on YouTube and Facebook, which is free advertising for us because it helps promote the product. Also, if you're not subscribed yet, go to the YouTube channel, click on the red rectangle, and click subscribe now. A bell will pop up. Click the bell. You'll be instantly notified every time I post a new episode. Also, this show continues in the comments. We read every comment. I personally like each comment, even the ones that criticize my COVID hair. That's okay. It's probably my mom doing that. That's right. And so please continue the comments. We appreciate that very much. Okay, where's Kevin? We are in Palisade, Colorado, which is right outside Grand Junction, which is before you get to Denver if you're going east. Where is that? Well, for those people who don't know, we're about we're about a mile high. And next this weekend, we're going to drive up to the Rocky Mountains, which is about 8,000 or 11,000 feet high. So we're half as high as we're going to be in this RV this weekend. Um, there's not a lot of oxygen up here either, George. Oh, my. Well, I hope you have a AAA card for when your engine yes. blows up <laughs> or the transmission <laughs> fails. One of the first things they tell you when you buy an RV is get the good SAM insurance. And so we got this super duper tow package that hopefully will tow us up the hill. Uh, now, people, Kevin, you must be awful rich to just go out and buy yourself an RV. No, we bought used. We bought really used. We bought a project. And that's why I become an RV mechanic, George. Um, you told me you were working in your garage this weekend. Yes. Uh, I spent Sunday afternoon deep prayer and meditation and sorting screwdrivers. Uh, I have, uh, Kevin has seen my garage. There's an old car in there, boxes of books, as well as dozens of Heinz pickle jars filled with screws and nuts and bolts and drawers and boxes of screwdrivers and tools and I spent a lovely afternoon separating flathead from Phillips head from Torx head to hex head screwdrivers and I think I'll open my own ace hardware store because I have enough to stock a hardware store well actually sorting screwdrivers is a manly thing to do I remember in 1995 when we first bought our house up in Thomaston uh, I went to Home Depot and bought the, the the DeWalt Deluxe screwdriver set. And I put them all on my little tool bench and I, I hung them up, tallest to shortest, and it worked. That was a great system until we had three kids. Dad, can I borrow a screwdriver? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Go down to the tool bench, grab whatever you need. Just be sure to put it back. Uh, 25 years later, I probably had one or two flatheads left. And when we bought the RV and I decided that I was going to be the RV mechanic, I went to Home Depot and bought myself a brand new DeWalt set. And I got a big tool bunch, uh, tool chest under the, the RV and we're ready to roll, George. So I, I, I know that that feeling of satisfaction, having, uh, a log logistical control of my, my screwdrivers. George, we should move on to the news. There's always one or two people that complain. You guys just keep talking about life, man. I just want to know what the news. Well, you'll be happy to know there's corruption in the news, and it may start at Lambeth Palace. We'll have to see what happens. But, George, on my news feed this week, Channel 4 did a report on Justin Welby, and Welby saying that uh, Lambeth and Justin are being investigated into how quickly they responded to the Jonathan... Jonathan Jonathan Smythe case. What's the story there? Well, Smythe was an abuser who operated. It was it was a barrister, uh, one of the leaders of the a lay leader of the English evangelical conservative evangelical movement, and he was involved with viewer in camps, which were the elite of the uh, English uh, boys' world, were invited to attend these summer camps to be uh, Christianized. Uh, Smythe would take some of the boys and then beat them and engage in uh, basically homoerotic sadism. 
And this was discovered in the early 80s, and Smythe was basically advised to leave the country. And Justin Welby was a camper, then a counselor at these camps. And later when he was in positions of authority, it's alleged in the Church of England, it's alleged that he was told about this personally and that he should have known about that as a camper because Smythe was beating some of his contemporaries. Boys talk to each other and rumors get around that old so-and-so is a pervert. Watch out for him. Well, on this show, we have uh, spoken in past years about victims of Smythe, victims of Jonathan Fletcher, and other people, uh, victims of, of other abusers who have gone to Justin Welby and to Lambeth Palace Shared and to the Archbishop these, of York. And to the Archbishop of York, John Santamu, and now the new one, Stephen Cottrell, mm -hmm. shared these problems. And nothing's really ever happened. Well, Channel 4 reported, and we don't have the details of the report, that a safeguarding investigation has been launched into Justin Welby's handling of the Smythe cases. Now, the Church of England Media Center released on the 27th a very curiously worded statement saying it is a matter of public record that in 2013 Lambeth Palace was informed about Smythe and that went into all this sort of waffling that Lambeth Palace of course informed the relevant diocese to make sure that all the proper steps were taken but the complaint is not against Lambeth Palace it's against Justin Welby so either we have some sloppy copy editing from the media center where we have some misdirection. Now why this is an issue is that um, we need to contrast the treatment of some bishops against other bishops. We have the famous George Bell case where the saintly Bishop of Chichester, one of the greatest English churchmen of the 20th century, was rubbished by uh, Martin Warner and Justin Welby, Warner's the current Bishop of Chichester, and Justin mm -hmm. Welby uh, for being a uh, pervert and an abuser of children. And none of this was true. And in fact, several of the complaints made were physically impossible. In other words, he was accused of molesting people five or six years after he died. Uh, that sort of nonsensical stuff. And Welby uh, went out of his way to blacken the reputation of George Bell. Now there was a pushback in that case, and the most recent, and you know, the George Bell Cafe at Chichester Cathedral was renamed something else. Well, quietly, if you look on the website, the cafe has been named back into George Bell's name. So there's a little pushback there. Then we have the Bishop of Lincoln who is a, a liberal squish, not particularly noticed, notif his head doesn't get far above the parapet. You don't hear much about him. He was stood down a year ago for allegedly not being vigorous enough in the investigation of abuse. And we still have not had a resolution of his case. And then we have George Carey, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who has been stood down, effectively laicized, meaning he cannot serve in a priestly or Episcopal capacity, and where he's living now, Diocese of Oxford, he lives in Berkshire, um, because from what we're able to tell, Carey himself doesn't know what the charge is, but from what we're able to tell, it has to do with Smythe. And Carey's only link to Smythe is that Smythe was a part-time student at the theological college where Carey was principal in the early 80s. Now, we've had two recent, last month, Stephen Cottrell, when he was Bishop of Reading, was informed of domestic abuse and evidently fumbled the ball, did nothing, passed it up the chain, passed it out, put it in somebody else's inbox, and basically didn't do what he was supposed to do. And he got away with saying, oh, I'm deeply sorry. And now that's done with. Now, Justin Welby is the victims of Smythe who have talk, talk, spoken to Welby have finally brought a safeguarding complaint or let me put it this way. We now are aware that they have brought a safeguarding complaint. That's much better, yes. Because we certainly have been talking about it for two, three years now. Yeah. And the Church of England is going to investigate. So this may be a, a version of the Me Too movement. 
uh, coming back to bite its, uh, you know, analogy to the Me Too movement of the people uh, complaining about uh, wanting to cancel people, they themselves get canceled. I mean, if this happened, I mean, if it turns out that Justin Welby had more knowledge than he's led on to and didn't do what he's supposed to do after he's gone after the Archbishop of Canterbury um, and, and others, I think that it's going to be imprudent for him to step down. I mean, this if it goes that high. I hope it doesn't, but uh, um, we don't need a fox in charge of the hen house. Uh, yeah, in other words, from the stories that we have heard, which we have not corroborated, mm -hmm. they're just merely anecdotal, and we, but we've been hearing it for a while now, is that Welby is guilty of the uh, abuse, not like Bell, Welby is not being accused of being an abuser, no. which was the, 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 the canard against Bell, but of being like George Carey, of not doing a proper thorough job. Not doing the paperwork. And in George Carey's case, the attitude and the worldviews of abuse 30 years ago were very different than they are today. I hate, hate to use that defense because it's not a good one, no. but it didn't have the priority. It certainly has the priority today. And part of the reason why people were so angry and exercised about Bell's treatment was that Welby was making a scapegoat out of Bell to cover up the church's inaction in other areas. Now it seems if the, if the most nasty rumors are true that Welby did far worse in this area than uh, Carrie is being accused of around Jonathan, around Smythe. So this week I'm going to allow George to talk about Indian corruption. We don't talk about it often because it could be a six hour topic every show. Um, but before that I want to step back and talk about corruption as a whole. Because every country, every society, every tribe, every nation has its own corruption. Uh, right now, we just closed down the Chinese consulate in Houston. Why? Because they were spying on local companies, stealing their ideas so they could make them cheaper in China. To a Chinese businessman, making something cheaper and selling it, even if it's not your idea, is fine. There's not a problem with that. That's part of their culture. Um, for us in the West, that's wrong. That's you, you're wronging us. You're stealing our ideas and you're making money off it. Um, and for many Asian business people, um, no, I, I'm making it cheaper than you could make it cheaper. And that's benefiting the customer. You're just sorry, you're doing it wrong. It's a different understanding. In places like China, and not China, India, and other places, uh, there's almost a, a mafioso type corruption where you're able to corrupt and steal money and, and take a, a little off the top for yourself if you're smart enough to share what you take off the top and spread it around. Uh, you know, kind of like give it to the family, give it to your friends, give it to the tribe so nobody turns you in. And so uh, in India, we have corruption within the church. People sell property for ungodly low sums, but they, they heap this big financial reward. They don't keep it all to themselves. They spread it out just so they don't get get caught and nobody points the finger and says it was him. Uh, it, uh, in Africa, it's a little bit different. Uh, our church back in early, mid-90s, we had a sister church over in Kenya. And we had an agreement that we would help pay for the school and help pay for, to put kids through the school and stuff like that. And so we would send them a check for 20 or 30 K a year. And they would, what we thought, apply to the budget they had given us. What was happening was the bus would break down and they would use the, all the money for the bus. Us and our Western minds were, well, you didn't, you didn't stick to the budget. So you, that's corrupt. That's wrong. How could you do that? They're like, wait a minute. There's no school with no bus. And so, you know, there's just different levels of understanding and corruption. Some is very wrong. Some is perceived as wrong. Some is different practice. Mafioso, China, India, in my mind, is corruption, wrong, and sin. Uh, what happens in Africa is just different accounting. Maybe, maybe not. George, so we're going to move on now and talk about the uh, Church of South India the bishop has been under investigation. 
the whole time Anglican Unscripted has existed. <laughs> but I'm going to let you talk about it. Tell me the story. Well, the Church of South India has the reputation, deservedly so, of being the most financially corrupt Anglican church in the communion. Mm, easily. Uh, at any one time, a majority, uh, a majority of the bishops have been under criminal investigation for the past decade. And see, American corruption or English corruption is different. American corruption is enriching yourself personally, or maybe your ch child or something like that. Right. Indian corruption, it's doing it for the team. Um, the family. The family. The and tribe. so yeah. that you may maintain your power by spreading the loot among your supporters. Once you stop spreading the loot, that's usually when you get kicked out or turned over to the cops because you're not sharing the wealth. In this particular case, the moderator, who is the leader or the archbishop of the Church of South India, he's called a moderator, um, his diocese has a medical school that is owned, that the diocese owns. And Indian medical schools, and it receives state support, but it's still owned by the government, uh, by the diocese. Uh, they, it's very rigorous uh, to get hard to get in. You have to pass these tests. You have to have all this and that. It's like getting into medical school in the United States. And as many of us know, in the United States, we have a lot of Indian doctors. So we do. A medical degree mm -hmm. and a command of English and some brains you can set up in the United States and you can make write your own ticket. Yeah. So it's a very, very rigorous mm -hmm. process. Well, the bishop at, was accused, uh, a, a TV station in southern India did a sting because there were rumors that you could buy admissions to this school by putting money uh, into the bishop's way. And the diocese and the TV station did a sting and sure enough, a diocesan official, the treasurer said, you know, uh, we're drawing up the admissions list right now to make sure, make sure your son's on it. It's going to cost you $50,000, the Indian equivalent in rupees. And this TV broadcast was shown and the Indian Medical Education Committee investigated and said, yes, massive fraud is going on, that they're selling places in the medical school uh, for, to wealthy parents for their children. And it's the bishop and it's the diocesan treasurer and the school principal. It's a group. Now, it's not just these three guys. They're taking the money and spreading it among other members of the clergy, lay leaders. The controlling, the controlling clique in the diocese is sharing the wealth ill-gotten. Some of the other things the bishop was accused of is, let's say we have a million-dollar property that we inherited from some mission society that's you know, vacant land somewhere that mission was never built. It's worth a million dollars in the market. It's carried on the books for a hundred thousand. Well, let's sell it for a hundred thousand to one of our buddies, uh, my brother-in-law, and then resell it at market value. And the nine hundred thousand dollar profit will split that between the developer and our team. Well, a judge last week said to the police, "Hey guys, you've been investigating this bishop for years." years and all you've done so far is interview secretaries and janitors and the little fry you know talk to investigate the people who actually you know it, it's like you know the police uh, just picking up the the corner pusher and not going after the kingpins Absolutely. in the penthouse sure, yeah. now these are bishops of the church of south india bishops of an anglican a christian denomination and a majority of them have been engaged in what we would call in the United States corrupt practices. The former moderator uh, spent 90 days in jail for contempt of court uh, after he refused to, you know, and he's been guilty of bishops uh, all across North India and South India have been jailed for corruption, for stealing. And the reason why I get so exercised about this is we had Michael Curry, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, do a webinar with the head of the Lutheran Church, ELCA, Elizabeth, jo Elizabeth Johnson. I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. Jeff Walton, a friend of this show, did a lovely little story about how clueless these people are. 
in the sense that, oh, well, we're strictly nonpartisan. And of course, they're hyper-partisan. <laughs> yeah, they are. Name one person in the Episcopal Church leadership who is pro-life, who voted for Trump, who, you know, is, uh, yeah, nonpartisan. Well, the, 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 one of the things that Michael Curry was quoted as saying, the greatest problems facing the earth today are white supremacy and the environmental crisis. Oh. Now, I respectfully disagree. <laughs> I think in the United States, I've not met a uh, I've not met a real white supremacist apart from movies. I mean, they don't exist. Yeah. And I live in a part of the world where there are guys driving around pickup trucks with Confederate flags. There are no white supremacists. There may be racists. There are racists everywhere, but there are no white supremacists. Rednecks, yeah. But yeah, but but that's not a white a white supremacist no. is someone who believes that every white person is better than every person who's non-white. Right. The way the Nazis were Aryan supremacists, mm -hmm. that the Jews were subhuman. That's a, that's a white supremacist. Or it was until maybe the last two, three weeks when anybody whom you dislike is a white supremacist. Correct. Yeah. My, and the environment, you know, the global warming thing, we're now having all these people come out saying, well, we may have been exaggerating a bit. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, Prince Charles and Al Gore telling us that by 2020, civilization as we know it would have ended you know we have three years that was 15 years ago for me the problems at least i it, as i recognize it in the developing world it is corruption it is the mm -hmm. corruption that the civil institutions don't work that you can go we've and i don't want to pick on india because we've done stories all across africa and asia and india We've done stories about liberals and conservative. A bishop in the church, province of Southeast Asia, one of the most theologically rigorous, one of their bishops who recently died uh, was a thief. He was stealing money from donations sent to overseas. He had a house outside of Bangkok that was funded entirely by, by funds raised in the West. Kevin and I reported on the bishop of Umzimbubu, who has since died and he was in investigating for hanky panky, and he was the reason why, is because he was not sharing the wealth among the diocesan clergy, and so they ratted him out to the national church, and they investigated. And when the auditors came the night before their visit, the cathedral burned down. God. With all the wreck, how did that happen? Just, well, did yeah. I leave that? Did I leave that burning ga can Candle. of gasoline yeah, in my right. office? Did I forget yeah. to put that out? Yeah, you know, the Mexican church for years was a byword for corruption and the uh, venality and how can the average and you wonder why in those in many parts of the world the anglican church is stagnant or dying uh some places like in the united states it's because it doesn't believe in anything the episcopal church but in other parts it is sold out and it's entirely part of the oppressor class and i think that's true i mean you and i uh I am so anti-corruption because of televangelists of the 80s, the Jim and Tammy Bakers, who would every week tell us how broke they were and all they were doing was moving their, their accounts from one account to money from one account to another um, and then building their own uh, Disneylands. Um, or the Kenneth Copelands, who needs the $135 million Learjet. Uh, I take corruption very seriously within the church and I don't mind society doing it. Go ahead. The church is here to be the solution to society, not to be a participant in society. And that's why we keep talking about what we keep talking about. Yeah. And, and, but there are many forms of corruption. There's the yeah. corruption that we have, the Archbishop of Hong Kong, yeah. who uh, is the uh, head of the Anglican Consultative Council, by the way, who backs the Chinese uh, Peking government in its crackdown on democracy. And is fully in bed with the with the same regime that is engaged in genocide and i don't toss that word out lightly yeah. against the uyghur muslims of yeah. uh, uh xinjiang in, in the western china who is leading the charge to destroy christianity across china this is an archbishop who says trust this government and if you're to be good chinese you have to to be a good chinese be a good Christian, you have to be a good Chinese citizen and support the Communist Party. That's a form, that's a form of moral corruption. Um, the Archbishop is preserving the status quo 
the wealth of the Hong Kong church, I believe, by selling out uh, its moral credibility. And you wonder why institutional Christianity has taken such a hard hit across the world. Yet at the same time, the faith is growing in leaps and bounds. But it's not growing because of people who are members of the trade union. It's growing because, I believe, of the movement of the spirit through men and ordinary men and women. Mm. Indeed. George, we've hit 24 minutes. I know we had a story or two. We'll talk about that next week. Uh, I don't know the schedule. Um, it's up to the internet. It's up to how much news we have. We've all been doing like one episode a week because it's been kind of slow news. It's just been COVID news over and over and over again. If you want to keep up with the latest updates, go to anglican.inc where George posts stories several times a week about what's happening around the Christian world. Until then, I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 613 of Anglican Unscripted.